All right, so Patrick Derm is our next talk from Joe. And I'm really excited about this talk because this is one of the first, uh, I think, big data platforms that's being built entirely on top of Kubernetes, written Golang. And I'm really interested to see the details of this. So with that, let's give a big warm of applause for Joe. Thank you, it's great to be here. Um, so yeah, I'm Joe Doliner. I am the founder of Pachyderm. And Pachyderm is a big data platform built on Kubernetes. Um, first off, a little bit about me. I was the uh, first employee at RethinkDB. And I also did some time babysitting the Hadoop cluster at, at Airbnb. So I know a little bit about what I'm talking about with this big data stuff. Um, so sorry about that, jumped ahead. So um, the reason I'm here actually it all started, I think, like two and a half years ago now. Um, and it started with chess. I actually just wanted to analyze a bunch of games of chess. And I needed some sort of a platform to do this on. And the only thing that existed at the time was Hadoop. Um, and so I sort of set to work setting up my Hadoop platform. And you know, for anybody who's tried to set up a Hadoop installation all by themselves, you know, this is like really hard. I, I, I never actually got to the chess part, because I, I spent all of my time just like trying to get it all configured. I think, did my mic die or is it good? I, I did what I'm sure so many of you have done before, which is I, I decided to go rogue and just sort of move a layer down the stack and, and work there. And so I, I set myself with the goal of let's, let's try building a modern Hadoop. Let's see what it would look like if, if this was easier. Um, and unfortunately, that didn't go very well either. Because as anybody knows, it, it takes a lot to build um, a system as complicated as that. Um, we have a little, a little information of, of a um, It was early 2014. Um, I took a look at why to build modern Hadoop and realized that I'd really gotten like keeps. I guess I'll just stay, stay right here. Um, so I never really got to, to, to the real like big data part. I spent all of my time just doing distributed systems. And you know, that's really hard. But this is early 2014, so Docker had like just come out. And you know, I was getting the feeling that this was going to be a really, really big movement in distributed systems and was going to revolutionize like everything. So I decided to just bet it all on the container ecosystem. I said, you know, like, I, I don't know what's, what's going to happen exactly there, but it's going to be approximately what I need. I'm just going to like jump out of this plane and so hope that somebody throws me a parachute on the way down. Um, and lo and behold, six months later, Kubernetes comes out. And you know, it, I remember talking to my co-founder, just like, well, well, there it is. You know, it, it happened. I have, I have that system now. Um, and since then, this, is, this has been about what life has been like. <laughs> um, and so for the rest of this talk, I'm just basically going to tell you about what we built on Kubernetes. You know, I think it's, it's very cool and probably one of the more sophisticated systems that's been built on it so far. Um, so let's dive in. This, this right here is sort of a from 10,000 feet view of um, what our architecture looks like. And I want to point out a few things. First off, there's these two major components here. There's the Pachyderm file system, which is our storage layer. And then there's the Pachyderm pipeline system, which is um, like our computation layer. And they sort of interact with each other through jobs. And um, one thing that I want to make very, very clear about these jobs is that those are actually Kubernetes jobs, the things that were you know, just released this morning in 1.1. And that was a very, very important part um, of our design, was to have these be like true Kubernetes objects that you can interact with the way that you're used to, not have them be some sort of a like black box that you can't see into. We, we want them to be a lot more like Legos. Um, and so you'll, you'll see sort of that, that played out through the rest of the talk. Um, so the, the first thing that we had to build was the Pachyderm file system. And you know, there are a lot of distributed, system, uh, distributed file systems out there. Um, we wanted to build our own because we had one very, very particular feature that we wanted on it. Um, we wanted it to support copy on write semantics. And you know, anybody who's sort of aware of all of the tools that are going on in both actually data infrastructure and infrastructure right now knows that copy on write is kind of having a bit of a renaissance right now. Um, it's the core technology that powers Docker, 
It's like how they do their file system layering. And it's also actually been pretty revolutionary in Spark. They, they call their copy and write implementation RDDs, but it's, it's conceptually um, very similar to ours. And the reason we wanted this is because copy on write actually lets you support all of the semantics of Git. Um, but it lets you do it for gigantic data sets. And when you put a distributed layer over it, then they're just like limitless data sets. Um, and this has a ton of really, really beneficial things for big data applications. First off is you can view diffs of data. So you know, even with petabytes of data coming in, Pachyderm can at any point say, like, here's, here's the data from the last day, and just show you only that data. Um, you can also instantly revert. So if something goes wrong in your cluster, you don't have to go into HDFS and, and poke around to try to get it back to its last good state. You can just sort of hit the undo button and go back to a previous commit. Um, this also drastically reduces storage needs. You know, it's, it's pretty common in Hadoop for people to make like 20 copies of pieces of data just so everybody can have their own sort of sandbox. Um, in our system, you can do that, but it doesn't actually take up any extra storage. It's like a branch in Git. And the final thing that's actually a much, much more subtle point of this, of, of what we get from copy on write storage, but we'll go, we'll go into it in more detail, is reliability. And the reason for that is that when, when, once something is in our file system, it's immutable. It's, it's not going to change, which means if you deploy a service on top of it, it's going to see the same data no matter what, and nothing can mess with it. Um, and that winds up being an incredibly powerful feature to have in your tool belt. Um, so the other piece we had to build, that's the file system. Uh, the other piece is the, pa the Pachyderm pipeline system. Um, and you can think of this as kind of like a data-aware container scheduler. It actually basically just rides on top of Kubernetes scheduling pieces, but it knows, knows how to sort of inject pieces of Pachyderm data into containers so that they have it available um, for processing. The you know, main things that it does is it can just run a job sort of ad hoc. It can also speak to PFS and have jobs get triggered by new commits of data coming in. And this is incredibly handy because it lets you sort of make a reactive pipeline that will get run every time something new comes in, and you'll know that like something comes out the other end and it, it'll just always be there. Um, it also can, let, can understand the data dependencies between jobs, right? So if, if one job is going to output data, it is the input to another job, it's smart enough to make sure that the first job completes and its data is available before the second job starts, and thus it, you always have your dependencies available. And lastly, just, just to make y'all clear, like it's, it's all leveraging this copy on write storage, um, and it, it leverages it in, in some pretty interesting ways. Um, so let's see, let's see a couple of the really cool things that we can do that aren't really available in other existing systems right now. Um, First off is, is our resiliency. Um, Kubernetes has this you know, really, really cool way of deploying things where you sort of just tell it what you want in the end, and it'll figure out all the details to get there. And you know, particularly for jobs, what that means is you say, I want this job to run to completion, and it'll just keep restarting it until that actually happens. Now, that's, that's great for a lot of types of jobs, but if your job is in any way modifying state, um, that gets really, really tricky. Right, because what happens is one job runs, it fails, but it's already written some of the state that it was going to write. And if that state's already there, the next time it runs, it, it messes everything up. And you get these sort of cascading failures where the job can never really complete. This was an absolute nightmare in Hadoop. And basically, every time that it happened, I would have to manually go in and figure out, OK, what did this job do when it failed? Let me undo all of that and then kick it off in a new clean environment. With a copy on write file system, this isn't an issue at all, right? Because when, when a job fails, we see that basically as a commit that never completed, and we know when we're restarting the job, okay, just throw that away. That was, that was a failed attempt. Let's take another go at that, and we can get back to exactly the situation we were in before. Um, another really cool thing that we can do with our copy on write storage is we can do very, very efficient incremental processing. Um, it's not uncommon in Hadoop to have like a gigantic pipeline of 500 jobs that runs every night. And on a given night, 300 of those jobs might be computing exactly the same thing they computed yesterday. It's, but they don't know, because they don't know how the data has changed. In a copy on writes system, you can see diffs. 
So if just a small amount of data changed, you know to only rerun the part of the pipeline that cares about that data. And you can actually run it a lot more efficiently if you know how to leverage just the diffs and just run it sort of incrementally on those. Um, and the last very, very cool thing that we can do with this is it lets us do very, very cost-effective resource management. Um, this is one of the really big problems in big data right now is that it's not easy to leverage things like the spot market. Systems like Hadoop weren't really built with those in mind, and you get very, very temperamental clusters if all of a sudden your nodes get revoked because you know, the, price, the price has gone up. However, once again, in a copy on write system, when you register this job, you say, I want to process this data right here, you're referring to an immutable commit of data, right? That's not going to change. It doesn't matter if you run this job now or if you run it next week. The results of the job will always be the same. And so in a system like this, we can completely delay execution until it's, it's most opportune. And we can even give you a system where you can say, hey, this, this job right here, I want this done as cheaply as possible. Wait until the spot market minimizes. And this one over here, this is really important. I want this done as quickly as possible. So just run this on the biggest, beefiest node you can find. Um, so to wrap this all up and tell you sort of why, why we're so excited to be building this system and, and particularly be in this ecosystem, um, I think that Kubernetes is, <laughs> I think that Kubernetes is an absolute game changer for distributed systems. Um, I think that we're quickly heading toward a future where companies are sort of just going to have their Kubernetes cluster and then a number of apps that run on top of Kubernetes. Um, Copy on write data is also a really powerful idea. It's, I think, not, not actually quite as new, but it's um, something that's really having a, a renaissance here. And if, if you agree on both of these ideas, then we would love to see you using Pachyderm, because we've really tried to bring them both together um, to sort of unlock that power of Kubernetes for big data for you. Um, and that's all I have. I'd love to take questions. I think I was a little bit under time, maybe. Um, Uh, yeah, questions? Anyone? Re repeat the question. Uh, the question is, copy on write file systems exist. What is different about this one? Um, so copy on write file systems exist in sort of the single node, like BetterFS, OverlayFS, um, ZFS world. I don't know of any other copy on write distributed file systems. And so the, the basically the difference between us and them is that we're distributed, and we're actually not implementing the single node version. We're just basically like taking a, a copy on write file system and adding the distributed layer on top. Uh, right there. Um, have, the question is, have we ported any existing Spark jobs, pipelines, anything to Pachyderm? Um, the answer is no, not yet. We are very, very interested in doing that. It's, it's really just a question of having the resources. Um, this, is, this is actually a two-person company, by the way. So um, we, we haven't gotten there yet, but we're very, very interested to. The, the one thing that we're really excited about, though, and I, I sort of didn't mention this anywhere else, um, we spent a very long time trying to figure out what the interface to the data was. Um, this was one of the things that has always just irked me about Hadoop is I don't like the MapReduce interface. I don't like having to write this like Java class with these weird methods reduce. Um, and what we eventually settled on was actually just giving people direct access to what looks like a local file system inside of their containers. And so in that sense, you can basically just run like the Spark code actually just as like a JVM inside of a container and read data directly off of disk. And in many cases, that will work. So once we do get there, we expect there to, it to be like a very, very quick process for porting over different systems. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's basically just a fuse layer that our, our container injects 
into the file system so it's visible to the user container. And that's basically just discovering the PFS node inside of the file system and reading data directly out of it. Can you the question is, can you use just our file system for some other purposes? Absolutely. That was another very, very important design goal, was PFS and PPS are designed to be completely separate systems. This makes more sense for PFS than PPS, because you know, PFS doesn't leverage PPS at all, so it just totally makes sense. Um, PPS without PFS doesn't get all of the copy on write benefits, um, but short answer, yes. And that's in general a design goal of ours. Like we. We don't want things to be tightly tied together. We want them to be easy to decouple um, and run. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the question is project state. Um, the answer is we've is what's sort of the project state right now. Uh, the answer is it's about a year since we publicly released it. Um, it's in alpha for sure. We're sort of have been working on the major release that like integrates all of the Kubernetes features. Um, you know, as, as you can tell, like jobs are a core part of what we do, and those weren't officially released until before this morning. So I haven't had a ton of time to digest that yet. But um, the the answer is that we're hoping to have this like out and available in like a truly usable form by the beginning of next year. There. Sorry, could you repeat that? Are we, is the question, are we going to provide a Lambda feed? How do you provide reliability uh, with node failures in PFS? How do we rely, provide the reliability with node failures in PFS? Ah, so basically what it's doing under the hood is it's storing sort of replicas of all of the data. And so each of each, each PFS node has a Kubernetes persistent volume that is attached to it, and that can follow the node around. If you know, that like, dies and the node goes away, we should have other replicas of the data within there that we can like, elect to master and sort of um, copy the data all around. We also provide the ability to checkpoint all of your diffs into a storage provider, such as S3 or Google Compute Storage, or yeah, that one. And uh, this, this sort of lets you piggyback on the reliability of those systems to make your cluster more reliable. What was the last thing? Snapshots, clones. Yep. Uh, so the question is, does PFS support snapshots and clones? Uh, yes. PFS supports snapshots. And it also supports basically the equivalent of git clone or git pull. Um, it can just sort of send diffs to another cluster, another data center, and it has like an internal format for that. Cool. So last question. Last question. There in the back. How, all right, the question is, how are we handling deletes? Um, that's a very good question. The, the handling of deletes, we have a way that we can sort of garbage collect commits, and actually a way that we can like thin out the resolution of commits. So you can say, you know, okay, for the last month I want a per day resolution, for the last year I want a per week resolution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's still, there's still a, a couple of details for us to figure out there because the, like weird state can propagate through the cluster, and you know, all of those things I said about you've got to commit for a job, it's not going to change. Well, it is going to change if you delete the commit. So you need to think about that and delete. Um, so the answer is we, we, have, we have some ideas on that, but they haven't fully all materialized. Cool. Um, oh, and that was the last question, so no. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I would love to answer more, but, but I just, I, I know this guy's. Thank <laughs> you.